I com dèiem, a aquesta hora continuem amb aquesta segona taula de la jornada d'avui, a la que hem volgut titular com el poder de la compra pública socialment responsable en l'electrònica. Es respondran a preguntes com ara d'on venen els minerals que importa la indústria tecnològica europea i quines condicions de treball s'extreuen. Tenen alguna cosa a dir-hi les administracions públiques? Aquestes són algunes de les preguntes que s'han formulat. I bé, aquest debat el moderarà la Carla Canal. La Carla ha treballat en l'àmbit de la coherència de polítiques públiques per al desenvolupament sostenible, tant a la Generalitat de Catalunya com actualment a la Direcció de Justícia Global i Cooperació Internacional de l'Ajuntament de Barcelona i ja la tenim a punt amb nosaltres. Carla, molt bon dia. Hola, bon dia. Presentaré, gràcies Georgina, presentaré primer la taula en català i els participants i després em canviaré a l'anglès per fer-los les preguntes. Doncs, bueno, molt agraïda de poder estar en aquesta taula parlant del poder de la compra pública socialment responsable en l'electrònica perquè realment les administracions públiques tenen un poder i una responsabilitat i una obligació d'avançar molt més molt millor i molt més ràpid, perquè sí s'estan fent coses, però encara estem lluny del que hauríem d'estar. I crec que aquests tres exemples i aquestes tres discussions ens ajudaran a avançar una mica en aquest debat. Primer de tot parlarà la Silke Ronse, que és una geòloga belga especialitzada en sols i aigües subterrànies. Ella treballa com a consultora en contaminació de sols i aigües i, a més, és voluntària a Catapa, que és una ONG belga, des de fa més de 8 anys, en els quals ha dirigit estudis sobre àrees altament afectades per la mineria a Bolívia i ens presentarà un dels últims estudis de Catapa. Després parlarà l'Erin Severhold, però la presentaré després. Si la Silke està a punt, li donaria la paraula. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, will I share my presentation? Here it should be. So, everybody sees the screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. So, last two years we were doing a research on the Bolivian mining cooperatives. Um, and last year we also continued the supply chain to link it with the European industry. So we were not only uh, visiting the mining cooperatives to see the situation uh, that is occurring there, but also uh, the whole supply chain. But let's start with um, the mining cooperatives in Bolivia. It's quite an important uh, amount of people who are working as cooperatives in Bolivia. As we can see, like in this first graph, um, the yellow brown part is the amount of miners that work in cooperatives in a cooperative way, and only a small part is um, private and public uh, state mines. But at the other side, if we see the amount of minerals that they are extracting, then we see that those mining cooperatives only are a small part of all minerals that are mined. This is in one part because of the, the equipment they have. They don't always uh, are able to do big investments to have good equipment but also because they work in very old mines, many times mines that date from colonial times and where the good minerals, the good veins are already uh, exhausted. Which kind of metals are they extracting? We focused on the department of Oruru. This is whole Bolivia. This is the highlands where most metal mining is, 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 do, is being done. And we focus on Oruro just because different departments of the country have different kinds of metals and different kinds of circumstances. The most important metals are uh, tin and uh, the minerals that contain uh, zinc and silver. They mostly occur in, uh, in the same veins and the same area. And they mostly don't only contain zinc and silver, but also lead and also uh, some interesting uh, metals, such as, for example, indium, we found. But those things, do, uh, but the indium, for example, does not in, uh, appear in the statistics because uh, it's not notified. It's uh, 
it's produced as a side product. But let's go to the mines themselves. Um, those are two female miners uh, which work in, in this uh, mine in the city center of Oruro, actually. Um, they say, well, we can gain a lot more money if we work in the mine than maybe if we work in a shop. So for them, it's interesting to work in the mine. But it also gives a lot of insecurity for them because they, um, they can have months where they don't find good veins. They cannot extract valuable materials and then they go to sell their material and they say, well, this, this, is, this has no value at all. So those times they don't have any income, which gives big insecurity. Also at the point we were visiting them, the zinc prices were very low for some miners to tell us that uh, they're thinking about stopping because it's not giving uh, sufficient income at that moment. So they are very, their life is very dependent on the, the market price of only one metal. Another point we have been seeing is the insecurity. Accidents occur a lot uh, and which can be fatal because the galleries are very small, people can fall, rocks can fall. And this is because they, they work for their own income. It's not always easy to make big investments or to invest a lot of time in also digging the, the rock that doesn't give them any income. And that's the reason why uh, the mines become quite dangerous to work in. Also, we see a lot of miners do not wearing masks, um, which causes illnesses, uh, silicosis, which is the miner's lung. Um, we heard about uh, young people less than 25 years old, which are not able to work anymore because of the the miners' lung is causing them uh, to, yeah, like their lungs are not serving anymore already at a very young age, which are very dramatic situations. Um, and something we didn't touch yet is the environmental contamination. This is a treatment plant. Uh, water is extracted from the mine to be able to work inside the mine. But uh, although it's meant for treatment, the treatment is not done because it is continuously inverting money for something that doesn't give them any income. And this is acid water, pH of three, which is running directly to the, into the river uh, and for sure also containing uh, a high variety of, uh, of different heavy metals. In the mining cooperative, they don't only extract the minerals, but they can also do like some further processing to give some added value. Not all, all mining cooperatives have the, the ability, not, on, not have the, the machines to do this kind of work, but those who have those uh, think it's quite interesting to have some, some added value. Here they are grinding the rock in, in smaller pieces, and then they manually separate the heavier metal containing rock from the lighter waste rock. Here they do it manually, um, but here they can also have some more mechanized ways, a way, mechanized ways to separate the, the, the valuable uh, minerals from the rest. Then the point comes where they have to sell their production. And some tell us that they, uh, they just rent a taxi for them to put the bags they produced inside and, and sell it to a local buyer. And many times then it's not the one who is offering most money for what they produce, but the ones that uh, can pay the fastest because it's important for them to have their income on time. Other cooperatives, they have like trucks, uh, one or two trucks, and then they gather all the material from their members. Because those cooperatives, they can be 20 people, but it can be also like 100 or, or has until 500 people inside one cooperative. And then they gather all the materials of all the people and they sell it all together to local buyers. Then the local buyers, their role is um, to prepare batches for export. They have also the contracts with the international buyers 
um, an important one is Trafigura, who is buying uh, the zinc concentrates, for example, in, in this area. They gather batch, batches, they, they mix it, uh, they can maybe do some further processing also themselves. And then it is transported by truck to the port of, uh, to some ports of Chile. And Bolivia doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a port themselves uh, in this area. And for those concentrates, the, mainly the port of Arica is used at the coast of Chile. From there, it is uh, transported by boats to the international market. We decided to further concentrate on the, the zinc concentrates, uh, which also, as I said, contain uh, uh, silver, but also some uh, less known metals such as indium. And if we see which countries Bolivia is exporting to, we see five main countries. Uh, we further researched on Belgium because we are based in Belgium. Um, but yeah, also big importance goes to three Asian countries and to Spain. But as I said, we focused further on Belgium. So let's look at what Belgium is importing in terms of zinc concentrates. And there we see that Bolivia is the main supplier for zinc concentrates um, arriving at, at the port of Antwerp in Belgium together with Mexico and many other countries. And from there, it's further, it's further distributed. The transport from Chile to the port of Antwerp happens with large bulk carriers. Uh, this is the, bar, the boat of the, or the ship Jan van Gent, which last year was transporting um, zinc concentrates to the port of Antwerp at the time we were researching, but each time with our other ships. Um, and this is Sea Invest. It's a terminal in the, in the port of Antwerp, which receives most, if not all, the zinc concentrates that arrive to Belgium. Here they uh, they can further grind the rocks, but mainly they they take samples of the rocks to then decide where the the materials go to for further processing. Their main client is Nearstar. Neostar uh, was until a few years ago a Belgian zinc um, smelter. Now it was is bought by uh, Trafigura, and uh, they have, among others, they have a, a metallurgical plant in France, in Belgium, in the Netherlands. For what is this area? No? They also have uh, other ones around the world. And as we know that the Bolivian concentrates contain also this indium I was mentioning before, uh, we can expect that after uh, analysis, many of the, uh, the Bolivian concentrates will go to this plant. It is the plant of Nierstar in Obi, in France, close to the Belgian border. Uh, and in this plant, they do not only produce the, the zinc, Metal. You don't oh, only. Yeah. Please show it. What's that? Uh, Silke, sorry. Uh, you, you you have two more minutes. Maybe also you could uh, go to the conclusion. If not, I will ask you also a question later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in this plant, they produce the zinc metal, but since ten years, they also produce. Indian metal here. It was it was a, a quite big inversion, but it, ah, appears to to be, it appears to be a good business to uh, to also produce this indium. It's a good thing that uh, Nearstar is using more metals from the same waste rock. Once it is extracted, it's a good thing to use as much as much of it as possible. But it has a counter side because, for example, the Bolivian state expects to be uh, for the buyers to pay royalties for all the metals that are commercially used. Although Nearstar is buying uh, indirectly for the zinc they import from Bolivia, but not for the indium 
they are important. Bolivia knows that their metals, their minerals contain indium, but they have no idea about how much indium it contains, uh, how much of it is further used commercially. And no royalties at all are paid for the indium that comes from Bolivia. Also, the miners who have sometimes difficulties to have enough income, they, um, they could use this extra as, as they are paid for the value of the material they are delivery, delivering. It is, uh, it is normal that they would also be paid for the indium content of the mineral they are delivering. This is the plan. Uh, Silke, yes, you have uh, one more minute. I'm so sorry because it is so interesting, and I also read the report, and it 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 it. So I, I thought maybe if you could uh, a little bit lead to the conclusions. Yeah, and after it's the we'll last. Uh, you. It's the sorry. last slide, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is the plant of Umicor. It's another plant. It's it's based in Belgium itself, and here they work on the waste materials that are coming from the other smelters. They also extract this indium. And I want to conclude with this indium uh, story uh, because maybe some people don't know what indium is used for. Uh, it's got an important rise in use uh, around 10 years ago mainly because it is an important substance for the flat panel displays, for touch screens, for LCD screens. Uh, indium is, uh, is, a main, is a main component to make this, uh, this technology possible. So that is what I want to share uh, with you about uh, the zinc supply chain, but at the end, uh, it appeared also be the history of the Indian supply chain. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silke. I will now, um, Ara introduire la Elin Sebehold. I will now introduce Elin, but after after these two presentations, we will have time for some questions, and after we will do the interview with Peter Paulicki. So I, I will I will change to Catalan again. Sorry, we, we have all the languages today. So um, la Elin Sebeholt is una is assessora de sostenibilitat a l'Ajuntament de Stavanger a Noruega. Ella participa en el compromís del municipi amb la contractació transparent i sostenible i anteriorment havia treballat com a consultora de sostenibilitat a Greenco i a Nordic Choice Hotels. La Elin és llicenciada en sostenibilitat per l'Escola Internacional de Negocis a Estocolm i també aprofito per dir que, bueno, que el, el mobile és, és, una, és, és una oportunitat excel·lent per conèixer eh, les entitats i les administracions que estan treballant en, en, aquests, en aquests temps. També dir-vos que tot la, totes aquestes entitats estan obertes a cooperar, a col·laborar, per dir-vos que eh, la Erin, des del seu ajuntament, està en contacte amb l'Ajuntament de Barcelona. Nosaltres els hi preguntem coses en concret, ens contesta si són, són persones que, que, a part de publicar tot el que poden, eh, estan obertes a que, els, a que els contactem i ens donen consells, etc. Participem en diversos grups de treball. Jo sé, també us deixaré aquí el meu e-mail per si algú que es connecta ara tingués eh, preguntes més endavant, també que sapigueu que ens podem posar en contacte i, que, i per, per començar com a formar part d'aquestes xarxes que tenim per avançar amb la compra pública responsable, juntament amb les ONGs i les altres administracions. Llavors, eh, Elin, I will now pass the floor to you and after your presentation we, we would have a little bit time for, to ask questions to you and Silke. Okay, so Elin, now it's your uh, your time. Uh, thank you, Carla. I hope you can see my screen now. See? Yes, if you want. Yes, great. Yeah. Let me just uh, swap uh, screens. There we go. Okay, so thank you, Carla, and thank you, Sessoms, for, for having me today. It's very exciting to, as, as Carla just said, to, to be able to share among us. It's, it's important for the progress of, of uh, transparency in, in, the, in the public procurement. So I know time is limited. I'm going to go just straight to the presentation. Um, I'll touch about a bit on the action plan we have here in Stavanger. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a procurement that we had last year and some of the details of that procurement details. 
and also a little bit about the challenges and lessons learned that we had. Uh, so first off, um, in Norway, as I think in many other countries, oh, um, there is the procurement law that requires public buyers to do what they can to limit the risks of violation of human rights. So of course we follow this, but we also want to go a little bit further and work with suppliers that are forward leaning. So suppliers that have insight and control of their supply chain and that know where the risks are most severe. So as we heard today, for example, the mining stage. Uh, so the action plan is part of our uh, procurement strategy, and it aims to ensure that our procurements are made in a sustainable, resource efficient and uh, non-discriminatory way. Um, end of each year, we do an overall risk assessment of all the procurements that are due the following year. And after that, we decide on which procurements that will include social criteria. So for uh, last year, uh, among others, we saw that there were several procurements in ICT coming up. And for several of these procurements, um, we did have a market dialogue with the suppliers um, where they were able to give their response and perspective uh, on the details of our procurement. And um, for the first procurement that I'm just gonna talk more about in a second, uh, we saw that the suppliers were much more engaged in talking about environmental aspects, but not so much about the social criteria. But for example, in a, uh, another procurement, the procurement of printers, it was much more engagement in, in the social criteria discussion. So I think we can learn um, from all of these procurements. All right, so um, the uh, procurement of Chromebook. Um, as I said, there were several of them, but this was the first one out. And um, the first, the, the, the one with maybe the, the, the hardest approach. So apart from the general contract, we used um, a special contract that is um, for social uh, criteria. And it's based on the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. And it uses due diligence as a method. In this procurement, we also used qualification requirement, and that is to make sure that the tenders um, have a quality system in place, that they have methods to fulfill the, the terms of our contract. Um, so we asked the tender to describe how the company works with the social um, uh, sustainability inside the company and in the supply chain. So as you can see, there's a, it's very small, but there's a assessment that we ask them to uh, fill in. And first part is about traceability in the supply chain. So they have to pick the two products uh, that they believe are associated with the greatest risks at the time of um, the tender. Uh, second part here is uh, an overall risk assessment of the two same products. And the last part is about the code of conduct and how they are following up uh, the code of conduct in their supply chain. Um, as you can see as well, for the technical specification, these were much more specialized and focused on the minerals used in the products. So as we just heard, this is a stage in production line where, the, where there is uh, quite high risks. So by using these criteria, we knew that the supplier was using um, a manufacturer that was also working uh, at this section of their supply line. And luckily, um, all the tenders we, re we received uh, were complying with these criteria. So that was good. All right, but to uh, focus even more on social uh, issues, we also used award criteria. And uh, for this procurement of Chromebooks, uh, it was weighted 60% and it was solely on social award criteria. And the last 40% was on price. Um, so we divided the social criteria into four, um, uh, four under criteria and they were weighted 25% each. The first part here um, was about the supplier's internal system for social, social responsibility. Um, so we asked them to describe their uh, internal training of employees, how they measure labor and human rights in relation to other aspects, 
and also the procedures for suspending or termination of contracts with manufacturers. And the uh, second part, um, as I said earlier, we were aiming for a high degree of transparency. So um, it was therefore important to know about the manufacturer and its suppliers. And we therefore asked for the manufacturer's code of conduct. And uh, we asked for information on, uh, for example, mining process, lists of extraction facilities, mining sites, and other locations relevant for the products that they offered us. And um, for this procurement, we received um, information down to the process of melting. Um, but nothing concrete covering the mineral stage. Um, this was somehow expected, as we know that following the raw materials before melting is often complicated. As we heard from Emmanuel and Silke, the, the system for traceability of minerals needs to be better. Um, so we did receive information and documentation that the suppliers include the mining stage in their work, but we didn't get any names of extraction uh, sites. But as we used the technical criteria before um, th that I mentioned before, we, uh, we knew that the manufacturer was certified in accordance to the RMI, which was good. And I also think that the, the standard of IRMA that we heard of earlier um, is very interesting and we will look closer at how, we, how this can be useful for us. Um, third criteria was capacity building. And uh, so we wanted to know if the tender was doing any capacity building in their supply chain. Um, and fourth criteria was external cooperation. So uh, was the tender working with any uh, external organization like non-profit organizations? Um, yeah, so that was the criteria that we used for Chromebooks. And I'll just, um, as I just mentioned, um, it, was, it was the first one and we did have several other procurements last year. And uh, some of the criteria there were a bit simpler and not weighted as much. And uh, when outlining criteria, it's important to look at how developed the suppliers are. So last year's procurement, they told us that um, there are different levels of maturity in the categories of ICT. So it is therefore important to adjust the criteria in accordance to the maturity level. So one way of doing this is um, um, it's one way of, of pushing for sustainability and social uh, criteria, but still um, apply with the maturity level uh, is to, uh, to use contract details. Um, for example, we can let the suppliers know by the contract details that in, for example, one year, we, we expect that this criteria is implemented. Uh, in Stavanger, we also want uh, as many suppliers as possible to, to deliver on our, our, procurement, uh, our procurements. I think uh, that's common by public procurers. But um, if not if it means that we must lower our standards to a degree that can't comply with our values. So with other words, it can be complicated to outline procurement documents and especially award criteria. And um, after the evaluation process for several of the ICT procurements last year, um, the suppliers wanted insight in each other's tenders, which is quite common for, for other criteria as well. But um, as their system for social sustainability was now weighted, uh, no one wanted to share information. Uh, and for us, wanting to, to lift the whole market and seeing the different approaches that the, the, the suppliers have for sustainability, um, as well as what they can learn from each other, um, that was a bit frustrating. Uh, so I think um, that to stimulate the whole market and for public buyers to be able to be procreative and using social criteria, there must be and more collaborations between suppliers and also between suppliers and buyers. So like pre-dialogue meetings and events like this, uh, for example, um, as, as Carla mentioned, we were happy to share among other buyers in Europe as well. Um, but following the program of the Chromebook, we, had received, uh, we have received a lot of reactions from the public and uh, we've been able to share our experience with them. 
We have also received reactions from the market that they uh, want us to keep on focusing on social criteria in the ICT procurements. Our suppliers also say that when public buyers ask for trans transparency and use criteria like this, they can use it to stimulate their own suppliers and brand owners to, to uh, improve their own processes. All right, I think time is running up. So I'll just finish uh, off by going back to the uh, award criteria itself. Um, it was late, it has later been considered in a legal perspective when we used it in a procurement of um, general ICT uh, equipment. So the criteria then became the basis for an appeal to the Public uh, Procurement Appeals Board. Um, and the appeal was uh, regarding both the outline of the criteria and the evaluation method. And uh, just a few days ago, we received the verdict. And unfortunately, the board concluded that criteria number three, capacity building, and criteria number four, external cooperation, lacks the necessary connection to the computer equipment. So the verdict has uh, not just uh, been handled by our jurists, so I can therefore not give you any more information on this, but I expect that the documents will be uh, publicly available. But um, we see the outcome of this complaint as a significant learning for both us and public procurers, I think in Norway, but maybe also outside of Norway. Um, so it has been an opportunity to put even more spotlight on the issues of social public procurement. And uh, we, know, we now hope that um, this will lead to a broader understanding and um, clarifications on the laws and reg regulations on how we as public buyers can use social criteria in our procurements. Right, so that was everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen. Um, I will now pass actually to Peter Paulicki from Electronics Watch um, because we are running out of time. But after our the interview we will do with Peter, uh, we will have time for some uh, questions, so uh, do not hesitate to, to write it in the chat. If not, I, I do have many um, questions, uh, because as Ellen said, um, it is crucial that, that this dialogue between the, the organizations in the field, um, the, the, the NGOs, the companies, and the public buyers, and also the, the general public, uh, in in order to do to to do the same to, to go in the same direction and 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 uh, and as Emmanuel stressed uh, to not to look for solutions uh, far from the reality. So uh, we will have time to talk a little bit about this later. But uh, let me now introduce uh, Peter Policki. Uh, sorry if I do not pronounce uh, your name well, but Peter, we, you, you will teach me in another time. He's based in Germany. He has more than 15 years ex uh, experience researching the globalization of the electronics industry and its impact on working conditions and labor rights. He has been part of several international research projects uh, on contract manufac manufacturing. Peter is director of outreach and education at Electronics Watch. So, Peter, how are you? Are you I'm here fine. with us? Yes, great. thank you. How are you? Uh, really great. Happy to have the mobile again. Yes. So, uh, maybe before we jump into the discussion about this RBA and the terms of the engagement, uh, could you first tell us briefly uh, what Electronics Watch is doing? Maybe yes. not everybody. Sure. I think I think many people that I've seen on the on the on the participation uh, board uh, already know it, but many probably don't. So, um, Ellen's in, in introduction was was really great because now we know that public buyers actually can include social criteria in procurement. So, so that's kind of um, that's a great thing. The, the the big question is how can public buyers make sure that these criteria, these social or environmental criteria, are actually implemented in the supply chain that they are buying from it. That's, um, that's the role that Electronic Swatch is taking. So we are uh, monitoring in the factories um, for our members or affiliates, how we call them. So these are pub public buyers in Europe and in Australia. 
We are monitoring in these factories. We are using something that is called worker-driven monitoring. So we are talking to workers. We are working with workers. And we put the interest of workers at the center of what we do. Um, so this is how we get to know what is happening in the factory. After that, we um, uh, go to the brands. So all the big brands, you, you know, with the reports we have generated and tell them, look, we have found these risks, we have found these uh, violations, and um, we want to work with you to improve on the situation. So at the end of the process, the idea is to have a better situation for workers in the uh, in the uh, the factories. Our affiliates are um, members, uh, they are our members from uh, public buyers. So. Um, hospitals, schools, universities, city councils, uh, regional governments, all these organizations that procure um, ICT hardware based on, on public procurement regulation. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to add that uh, Barcelona City Council and also Generalitat de Catalunya, ACM. Okay, I, I, I'm just talking because I, I know we have some Catalan public just to know that. Uh, uh, other other um, cities in in Catalonia, in Spain, in mm. France, in Norway, etc., are are apart from Electronics Watch, and, mm. and we are really happy because we do like this approach, this sensitive approach, and that and that, and that the the final result is the improvement of the of of the situation of the mm. workers. So. Um, uh, yeah, when, when Electronics Watch works with the, the industry, uh, you work a lot with brands, no? like Apple, mm. Cisco, Dell, HP, or Samsung. Um, and also, uh, now you engage with the RBA. So could mm. you tell us who uh, or what is RBA? Uh, sure. Uh, so yes, uh, I completely for, forgot to, to mention that Catalonia region and all its entities, it's actually one of the mo uh, lead, most leading regions when it comes to sustainable public pro procurement. So it's, it's always really great to come to Barcelona, even if it's only digitally. Um, so the RBA, the RBA is the Responsible Business Alliance. It is a, to put it very uh, briefly, it is an industry association of the electronics industry. Uh, the RBA has established a voluntary scheme to improve working and environmental con conditions throughout the electronics supply chain. Um, most brands you would know, so the, the ones um, Carla already mentioned, and every brand that you think of that has something to do in electronics, most of them are members of the uh, RBA and also their manufacturers. So companies like Foxconn that you might have heard of, or companies like Quanta, Inventec, but also the component companies. So companies like Intel, you might know, or um, any TSMC is right now in the news. So all of them are members of the RBA. The RBA is pretty, I don't want to say old, but they, they already have a history. They were founded in 2004 as the Electronics Industry Citizen Coalition back then. And they introduced this voluntary code of conduct. Um, and for years, many civil society organizations were criticizing the RBA very strongly because the code was actually not in line with the central uh, ILO core labor standard. So it was below these standards. It took um, a lot of work from civil society organizations, a lot of pressure, a lot of um, uh, reports and, 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 well, a lot of work basically to get the RBA to be where it is at, at right now. So the code is mostly in line with the ILO uh, um, uh, core labor standards. There are some discussions about the definition of uh, freedom of association and there might be legal um, interpretations that say it's not yet there, but so we see a development. The development took quite long. It was 16 years or 17 years uh, for an industry that, is always saying we are so fast, we are so innovative, we we do so many things. It's a bit, I would say it's a bit, it took a bit long, but they are there. They have this, this, this voluntary scheme. And this is why, because we represent public bias towards the, uh, the electronics industry, obviously their industry association is also a partner, of, uh, or not a partner, but a, a point of contact for us. 
Yeah, so, so last month, uh, Electronic Swatch uh, has signed a terms of engagement with R RBA. And uh, well, I know something about it, but I am <laughs> curious if you can explain because a few years ago, this would have been difficult, no? So yeah. if you can tell us a little bit more about. So yes, yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned, the RBA has a process, they have a code of conduct, they have uh, auditing schemes, um, they have a process. Electronics Watch has also a process. So we have this worker-driven monitoring, we have, we have a methodology how to, how to do the monitoring, we have a, a, a specific system how to engage with the industry. So we, both organizations basically have their systems how to do things. These systems, don't really work very well to, together. So the terms of engagement, when you take a very big step back, it's actually defining an interface between these two systems. So to make them, um, make them compatible, it defines steps. So it says what is to be done. It says how long it can take and the how long is actually a very important part. Uh, who needs to be involved and what the output is. So we have standardized basically how we work together. Um, it took 12 months off negotiation. Uh, the negotiations were very strenuous. They were very hard. Um, but already during the process, we saw that there is an, a mutual learning on both sides, on the side of the RBA and on our side. It's, um, I think we, had, we developed a better understanding of who we are, where we come from. Um, we have not become partners. No, we are still on the opposite of the, the room, but we have learned how to work together, how to cooperate. For Electronic Swatch, our understanding is that sustainable change in the factories will only happen when cooperation will occur on various levels we are in no position to force something on, on companies. We are talking here about companies that are multi-billion dollar companies. There is currently no force to, to do it by force, but cooperation can lead to, to change. And this is why we think that this defines cooperation, how we will. Um, and we do think that this agreement will strengthen our role to protect workers' rights and affiliate supply chains. Very important, my last point, it's transparent. So you can actually go to our website and download the document and, and, and read it. Good, good. This is uh, really interesting. Um, and I wanted also to ask you about what will, what you, you think will be the challenge in this. Mm. Uh, but also, I, 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 want, I want also to, to, to ask you something different. Uh, um, in line more with the mining, I know that uh, Electronics Watch has has a very um, a, a very good system until the factories, mm -hmm. and 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 you participate like other other partners in uh, other projects, uh, looking more the transparency through through mining, no. And I don't know if you will also uh, work with this with. RBA mm -hmm. um, until the mining until the mines and uh, yeah and that's it if you if you want just to finish uh, saying well, what are the challenges or, mm -hmm. or, or or why do you think this is good for mm -hmm. the people no this this yeah. kind of very hard negotiations I mean I, I understand <laughs> so yeah so so yes our long long term perspective is definitely uh, going beyond factories looking into mines we currently have three pilot projects in Bolivia, in Congo, and in the Philippines to look into how to do worker-driven monitoring and industry engagement. Mining is a complete different beast. We are learning a lot. We are we're actually learning probably more from our monitoring partners that they learn from us. So this will take some time. Um, what is the importance of this, this, this result that, that we have had with uh, the RBA? I think the biggest, uh, the biggest um, sign for me that this document is, is that it acknowledges actually the power of public procurement, of organized public procurement. So again, what Ellen mentioned, this public buyers coming together, sharing ideas, but also coming together and building a platform to 
coordinate their communication, their actions towards the industry. This is important. Electronics Watch is kind of this platform. And this document, these terms of engagement actually are uh, the acknowledgement that this is, this is powerful. Um, what are the challenges? Well, let's see how this will work out. Until now, we have a document. Fine. It's a result of a lot of work. Great. Um, but we want to be accountable in, so if you ask me in one year time, I will, I might be fuming, I might have, have a red hat and start saying everything went wrong, or I might be very happy and say, well, we learned a lot. Now we apply these learnings to develop this terms of engagement further, because the idea is to have revisions of this document, to, to improve it as we go along. But what what how it what the outcomes will be we will just see in practice because now it's just a document we have started to already some processes have already started to engage based on this but in one year time we we can so in in the next um um mobile social congress in 2022 we will be definitely able to talk more about how happy we are with it and what what impacts we see Yes, yes, we hope so. Thank you very much, Peter. I, I, I will um, now, I mean, as if there are not other um, questions from the public, I, I will just end up this uh, session by asking you three, I mean, I saw in the Katapa document, uh, in the conclusions, no, they said um, that the EU's diligence framework is not working, no, because it is not comprehensive. There is no transparency uh, because there is no uh, mandatory um, uh, mandatory to, to the companies to collect data and make it accessible to the public, so so everybody can check its veracity. There, there's no accountability towards workers and communities, and uh, and there is no governing body. So it, it it there's a lot of things. But to focus on transparency, because this is a, a, a common subject between the three uh, participants of, of, of this panel. Uh, do you think that, um, sorry, um, I mean, I, I saw, uh, just to come back to the public uh, procurement, uh, when we saw a, a good example is uh, uh, an example that they, um, sorry, yeah, that, they, sorry, I mean, that, that they, 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 they do ask for some transparency, but only in a two of the levels no, of, of the chain. So, um, yeah, I mean, what do you think should be the, the next steps also in, in, the, in, in asking transparency uh, from, from the computer until the mine? I mean, not only until the factory that this already we have with electronics watch we, in, in Barcelona, for example, we put in the contract. We want, we want to know exactly in what uh, company is, is made and we have this information. But if we say, we want to know exactly from what mine um, does the minerals come, they, don't, they do not answer this. So, but I mean, I just wanted to remember that uh, public procurers can ask these transparency requirements. I mean, it, it is legal to ask for this. And come on, I mean, these brands, I mean, if Tesla can go to the moon, Tesla can know where the minerals come from now. So, I mean, th there are technical uh, 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 and, and, and local ways to, to know the, all the transparency. So, so what, what do you all think should be, should be done by public procurers to ask for transparency in all the, in all the way? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just start with my input. I think maybe Peter is better to, to answer this question. But as, as I said, uh, in, in general, in our qualification requirement, we use the, the, the two step, as you say, like down to production level and uh, uh, the, the parts of the products. <clears throat> so just two steps. Uh, and that is somehow the basic. And <clears throat> what we tried in this procurement was to use it as an award criteria as well to, to see if they could go further. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't get any concrete, uh, concrete information on that. Um, I think uh, 
as a public buyer as well, you need to keep the competition uh, up, you know, you need to secure that you get tenders. So I think it needs to come on a higher level. Um, maybe as, as Peter uh, saying, like together with the, the, the organizations like Electronic Watch that actually have more insights. I mean, I was surprised to, I know that there was uh, somehow complicated to follow the, the minerals up to melting, but when um, Silke was talking about the taxis and that, that way of selling the minerals, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty hard for us at this end to, to, to um, come with criteria um, that, you know, like is, is very specific, but I would love to hear what Peter says as well. Well, I think I, th I, I think it's important to 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 move along and basically, yes, they, com companies always say it's hard, but I think if more public buyers ask about these things, then then they will learn that they have to to deliver. And I think also, and this is why why, why I liked your your example, Ellen, to to also put it into the, the award criteria. So kind of not only ask, but kind of tighten the, the, the screws each time you ask about it. And not only ask about tier one or tier two, but ask also about tier three, because you know the lower you go, even in manufacturing, the worse the conditions get. I mean, yes, the, the, the final assembly factories already look fine because they were for, for the last 10 years already in the focus of many civil society organizations. But if you go to tier three companies that basically supply the suppliers, it's, 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 it's really bad. I think what we need to change, and this is something that I think uh, public buyers are very good to, to uh, in a good position to do is to change the discussion and not say, well, um, the industry is always saying it's not possible. Um, but the industry has to say, how is it possible? Because the, you know, if Silke, coming from a small NGO in Belgium, can trace the supply chain, how can Apple, HP, and Dell, who are making billions each year, how can't they? I mean, it's just a, it's just a decision to either not know or to, to know. It's a decision to invest or not to invest. The question is, is, is then how to communicate as a, pub, a public buyer. And award criteria are a good point because if you put this as an award criteria and this would help a, um, a, a, a brand to kind of offset the cost for such a program to understand this. Well, that's an incentive that you can actually work with. So I think it's, we need to get public buyers to be more persistent and more kind of be more radical in what they ask for. And it's actually not radical to ask for to knowing where the, where the stuff is coming from because this is just the first step of transparency to know where it's coming from. The next step is asking, what do you know? Tell me about your audit reports. What have you been doing? What, so you know, Knowing the supply chain is just the first step. And even Thank there, you. yeah. Thank you, Peter. I'm sorry I have to cut it here. I do agree with you. And I also think not only a word criteria, but a, a as a requirement, we should ask transparency. Because if not, uh, people, I mean, there are companies that say, we could do it, but if the others are not uh, obliged, we will not do it. So it would be uh, mandatory. And, and, and they do have the technical capacities to to, to, I mean, they do have, I mean, they cannot say it's impossible, come on. So I'm so sorry, uh, we, we did five minutes more um, apart from the others. So uh, yes, I, I will pass now to the presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Muchas gracias a los ponentes. Esta segona taula, comprar responsablement amb l'electrònica. Thank you, Silvia, Aline, Peter, i sobretot a la moderadora, la Carla Canal. Bé, ara, en principi, us convidem a fer una breu pausa. Ho farem amb un vídeo que projectarem, que hem realitzat conjuntament amb CETEM, el Boani i Enginyeria Sin Fronteres, respecte als impactes de la mineria a la República Democràtica del Congo. El posarem en castellà, no us el perdeu. Un cop acabat aquest vídeo ja introduirem aquesta tercera taula d'aquesta primera jornada d'avui. Fins ara.
Cada día conectas con cientos de conflictos armados. Nuestros aparatos electrónicos contienen minerales cuya explotación genera un importante impacto. En lugares como la República Democrática del Congo, a la extracción se suma un contexto de conflicto armado y la violación sistemática de los derechos humanos. Por eso es importante que nos informemos para poder actuar. We bring uh, human rights cases all over the world and I now have one in the Democratic Republic of Congo where I represent 14 families. Eight of the families are represent children who were injured in mine collapses. The children are given shovels and they dig tunnels to reach the cobalt veins and they dig in very loose rock. They don't have any protective beams, no protective equipment and inevitably the tunnels collapse. We have sued five of the largest technology companies there are. In the case of Apple and Microsoft and Tesla, they claim to be trillion dollar companies and they have turned a blind eye to what they know is going on in the DRC and that is children are being maimed and killed. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo dans sa partie est. On organisation la synergie des femmes pour les victimes des violences sexuelles travaille pour la promotion des droits de la femme en général et de la femme victime des violences sexuelles en particulier. L'est de la République démocratique du Congo est riche, c'est un scandale géologique, est riche en minéraux. C'est une malédiction, puisque l'exploitation illégale font que les femmes et les filles sont violentées chaque jour, font que les femmes et les filles et même les hommes sont tués chaque jour lors des affrontements. Il y a l'environnement qui est détruit et il y a des personnes qui perdent leur vie. Nous voulons vraiment que ces multinationales qui se donnent à l'exploitation illégale des ressources naturelles s'occupent du bien-être des populations vivant dans les sites où ces minéraux sont exploités. Promover un modelo électronique juste qui garantice les droits humains est imprescindible. No seas cómplice de una electrónica injusta. Juntas y juntos podemos hacer que esto cambie.